Hello, everybody. Welcome to the final session of the day. Um, and a special, well, a special vote of thanks and a special word of congratulations to those of you who are still here. Um, congratulations on surviving the day so far. Uh, and thank you for sticking with us. Uh, John and I have got what we sometimes call in English the graveyard shift, you know, the last one. Uh, and uh, a number of people have decided they've learned enough today and have left us alone. Uh, fine, thank you very much. But thank you very much for staying, and I hope uh, you, you'll find it interesting and worth it. What John and I want to look at with you, I'm going to talk for the first part and then hand over to John. We want to look at an area which has become, in the few days that I've been in India, I flew out on Monday of last week, and I've been here so for five days, taking part in a lot of uh, activity and work to do with the quality standards framework, but yesterday taking part in the launch of a new British Council publication about CPD. And in the words, in the time that I've been here in India, apart from sets and subsets, uh, the other word that has been on everybody's lips has been CPD, uh, continuing professional development. And we just want to look at this fairly briefly and fairly quickly and fairly, uh, I hope interestingly, um, in relation to the quality standards framework and how does CPD relate to the quality standards framework and the quality standards program. Uh, because just as a starting point, one of the 10 areas uh, that we look at is CPD, is continuing professional development. So the, within the framework, we're very interested in what schools are doing in this area. Uh, and so it, I think it's legitimate to talk about it here, but also because other frameworks and other areas are involved, which I hope you will find interesting. Now, there aren't many of us left, but among the people who are here, how many, have we got any school principals actually in the audience? One, two, three, four, oh, okay, fine. Well, we've got some, because I've got a question for school principals, and if you are a school principal, if you're not a school principal, think about your school principal. And my question to the school principals is, do you want good teachers in your school? I can see a number of people thinking, yeah, yeah, of course, why? Okay, I mean, of course you do. Nobody would say, oh, I don't want good teachers in my school. No, 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 no. Of course you, of course you want good teachers in your school, but then why do you want good teachers? Because they'll do good. Okay. Any other, any other suggestions? Why might a principal want good teachers in his or her school? Sorry? Okay. To improve the quality of the standard of education. Okay. I don't know if you caught that. So to do justice to the profession. Um, uh, that's why we want teachers good teachers in our school. To do justice to the work of the school uh, is, is, is another way of looking at it, isn't it? Um, I mean, in a way, the question is, an, the, the answers to the question are obvious answers, um, but it's worth asking them all anyway, because it may throw up some insight for us into why we should bother investing time and money and energy in helping teachers in this way. And I think the, the, the reason is actually quite simple in terms of a, a diagram. If we start in the top left-hand corner, we, we, we say good teachers lead to good teaching, we, we assume. Good teaching leads to good learning, we assume. And good learning means that you've got happy students. And equally importantly, happy parents. So one of the, that, that, and that's what every school principal wants, I think. You want happy students, you want happy parents, you also want happy teachers, um, but the focus on the outcome of having good teachers is that you have happy students, you have happy parents, and that's a nice 
position to be in. Uh, you've got a good school with good teachers, happy students, happy parents. Wow, we all want to be there. That's, that's, that's a good place to be. But there's a number of problems about this, aren't there? We, we can all say easily, yeah, we want good teachers. My school employs good teachers. My school only employs good teachers. We as teachers want to be good. But what do we mean by a good teacher? What is it that makes a teacher good? And that's a very, you know, that's a really interesting question. It's a sort of philosophical question. Uh, it's a, a theoretical question. But it's also a very practical question because we can all sit down and imagine our idea of what a good teacher is. Maybe some of us, some of you, some of us, maybe you're lucky enough to be able to think back over your education, either at school or at university or in, in later life, think back to a time when you actually had a good teacher, a teacher who really helped you and your colleagues with learning in whatever area it might be. And I can think back to my schooling. And when I was at school, I had, to be honest, quite a number of not so good teachers who didn't really inspire me or who didn't really challenge me. But I had one teacher, particularly, who was teaching me French, as it happened. And as a result of the time that I spent with that teacher, I just got fabulously fascinated and interested in French. I went on to study French at university, and I've made my career out of teaching English. But that's another story. Um, but the, the effect of this teacher was significant for me. But why and how and what was that teacher doing? What makes a good teacher seems to me a very interesting area of inquiry. We'll come back to it in a moment, but I think to flag that up as a starting point, we want good teachers. So what does that mean? What, 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 what does that involve? And then imagine we've got good teachers. Is good an absolute term or a relative term? It's relative, isn't it? Good is what those of us who are English teachers and have studied English, you'll know that good in English is a gradable adjective. It's not a non-gradable adjective. So you can be good, you can be quite good, you can be very good, you can be extremely good. So good is a developing concept. It's not something which you stop being with no prospect of getting better. I mean, we even have the comparative form, don't we? So this is good, but this is better. So how do we help our teachers to keep getting better? Because I think one of, one of the beliefs of a lot of people in education is that you, 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 never reach the, you never reach a point where you can think seriously there's no further to go. There's always somewhere further to go. There's always some improvement to make. So how can we help our teachers to do that? And again, I'm thinking of the principals, the school principals. What can you as the school principal do to facilitate this for your teachers? Because the third area on the side there is about responsibility. Because I know that in the world, there are schools and school principals who will say, Yes, of course I believe in teacher development, but it's up to the teachers to develop themselves. They're adults, they're autonomous adults, they should take responsibility for their own development. Fine, let them do it. And yet those of us who were, uh, I, I don't know if anybody in the audience was, was also there yesterday afternoon, but I said I, went, I came along to the British Council to a book launch about a, the, the new book on 
uh, continuing professional development, which is in your pack, I think. That was launched at a little ceremony yesterday in the British Council, and a number of people talked about uh, CPD, continuing professional development, and, and how it could best be made to work. And one of the most interesting contributions for me was the speaker who showed and talked about the research evidence that the most effective CPD takes place in an environment where the teachers are engaged and the school is supportive in facilitating that CPD. Sure, teachers can do some things on their own, but it's much more effective and much more likely to be in the school's interests and focused on areas which are of relevance to the school if the school is active in facilitating. Now, again, we can talk later about what that actually means and what the school can do to facilitate it, but the commitment of the school, the involvement of the school, the engagement of the school is very often mediated through the principal. And again, if you remember this morning, the presentation that we had in the first session about the difference between the public schools and the private schools was largely that at the, in the private schools, there was a commitment to CPD, which the school, the principal, was, uh, was mediating. So, what is a good teacher? What can we develop? for a teacher, and where are the areas where a teacher can help to develop himself and herself? Now, you know we've talked a lot this afternoon about the quality standards framework. You'll begin to think that the British Council does nothing but create frameworks, but they have created another framework, which is a framework for CPD for continuing professional development. The, the, the URL, the web address for this document, is an extremely long and complicated one. So the simplest way to find this online is to search British Council India CPD Framework. And there you will find a PDF file that you can download which sets out the framework. Um, what, the, what the framework offers you, the way that it works, is to look at four areas, and it defines the content areas. We'll look at these in a moment and see what I mean by that. But if you're going to, if you're going to involve yourself as, uh, in, in CPD as a teacher, or if you want to encourage your, your staff, to develop themselves in, uh, with a CPD orientation, then you, well, what, what exactly uh, are you going to look at? What, what exactly do you want to cover in your CPD program? So that's the content area. Now, the framework defines a set of possible content areas. It's probably not an exhaustive set of content because there's all sorts of things which, which you could always add into it, but it gives you a very good starting point for defining the content. And then you need to define progress, you know, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're good, okay, but how can we get better in these areas? And if we're not so good, how can we get better? So what does progress mean in terms of becoming and developing being a good teacher? And then you need to think, OK, I, this is the area I want to work in. This is the sort of progress I want to make. So what can I do to actually make progress? What can I do to get higher up the scale? And so we need to think about activities. What, what, what sort of activities? Now, again, the framework offers you a range of activities which will help you to develop skills and competences in certain areas. Uh, and resources in order to develop activities and resources are both necessary. So we need to think about 
identifying activities, identifying resources. And that's the framework. That's, if you like, that's a systematic approach to saying, what is CPT all about? It's about content, it's about progress, it's about development activities, and it's about development resources. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute about the first two of those, and then John's going to pick it up uh, and talk about three and four and take the discussion a little bit further. So, first of all, about content. Now, if we're looking at a teacher to see how good is this teacher, we might look in three areas. And one is to look at the formal qualifications that this teacher has. Now, formal qualifications are not always an indicator of a good classroom teacher. But it's a starting point, okay? And it's something tangible and something specific that you can look at. And you can look at a teacher's general level of education and a teacher's specific qualifications in the field of ELT. And you can check those quite easily. You can look at a teacher's certificates and you can see, yeah, this teacher has taken this award, this award, this degree, that degree, this certificate, that certificate. And you can check those. And you can make progress by moving up the ladder. If you've got a B ed, then you can take an M ed. Or you can take a PhD. I mean, you can move up the ladder you can, in a fairly obvious way in relation to formal qualifications. Then if we're talking about an English teacher, and in this room, in this forum, in this context, that's what we're talking about, then another obvious area in which we need to be interested is the teacher's English language ability and competence. So how good are my teachers at English? That's a question a principal might be interested to know the answer to. And in a number of schools that I've visited recently, teachers, before they're appointed, are asked to prove that they can write, you often write, that they can write English to what the principal considers to be an acceptable level. Now, we would say, within the framework, that what is an, an acceptable level for a teacher, I mean, of course, at the end, this is always, it's the school's decision, what they decide is an acceptable level. But we would say that the level should be defined externally, that there should be some external reference point that the teacher can turn to, to prove that they're at, at a level. And that often means taking an external test which is recognized as being at a certain level. So, I mean, you could take something like the IELTS test, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and say, we want all our teachers to have a score of, I don't know, 6.5, 5.5, 7. You name the level for your school. But you would say, I want my teachers to show they are at this level. And then you're, re you're referencing yourself against an external benchmark. Within our framework, the quality standards framework, those of you who've looked at the framework will see that we, we actually require, at, at level four, we require schools to benchmark their assessment of language proficiency against the common European framework. Uh, and this is one of the areas that John mentioned earlier, that probably a lot of schools are not doing that at the moment. Uh, but we think, or we feel, the scheme feels, that referencing your, the, refer the, the language proficiency of your teachers and your students against an external, internationally recognized standard is a good thing to do. And of course, how do you get better? Well, you've got a score of 5.5 or 6 on IELTS. Well, next time, you want 6.5. Next time, you want 7. Next time, you want 7.5. So you get better. And then there's this area, the third area, 
of what makes a good teacher is what we've called teaching and personal competencies. So the sorts of things that teachers need to be able to do in the classroom and in their teaching. And these are a mixture to some extent of personal qualities and characteristics and teaching, well, well teaching competencies, things which are specific to the domain of teaching. So, I mean, some examples of the sorts of things that teachers need to be able to do. Planning lessons and courses, managing a lesson in terms of the staging of the lesson, the stages of lesson, evaluating and assessing learning, integrating digital resources and digital materials, Using multilingual approaches, this is something which is obviously of great importance in, in India, in the Indian context, where you may have a class with a, a variety of different first languages, where you yourself, in some parts of India, may not even share a first language with, with most of the students in your class. So how you cope with that and how you deal with that as a teacher that's a skill, that's a competence you need to develop. And using inclusive practices, making sure that the work you do and the way you conduct the lessons, that that involves and includes and is appropriate for all the students in your class, not just a few of them or a number of them. So the, the, these are what we mean by personal and teaching competences. In the framework document, when you download that, if you, if you take my uh, advice and do so, you'll find that there are 20 or so personal competences, of, uh, personal and teaching competences of this type, which cover a wide spectrum of the skills and the competences that a teacher needs in the classroom. Now, the question is, how do you, how do you, how do you assess where you are in relation to one of these skills and competences, and how do you make progress? Well, the answer to that is that we, we have a scale of progress which relates to all of these areas. And it's actually exactly the same scale that we use within the quality standards framework. If you remember before the coffee break, when John and I were talking about this, I said, that, the scale, that our quality standards framework operates at five levels. Well, these same five levels apply to teacher competences and teacher skills. And they start off, if we take the area of using inclusive practices, it starts off at the bottom left-hand corner with the lowest level, awareness. I've heard about inclusive practice. Somebody was talking about it sometime, and I, so I heard the words understanding, yeah, and now I know what the words mean and why they're important. Up to engaged, I use, I use inclusive practices regularly in my work. Up to integrated level, my competence in this area informs everything I do in my work. So I'm so, I'm, I'm really clued up about inclusive practices and I really use them, I really make use of them regularly. And then the fifth level, leadership, in a teacher development context, a CPD context, this would be the stage where you feel that you can actually contribute to the training and the development of your colleagues. Or that a school which is really good in this area can contribute to the development of other schools in this area because you can take on a leadership role. So that escalator, that movement up from awareness, understanding, engaging, this is what progress in CPD means in terms of the teacher competences and the teacher uh, personal and professional competency. So now I'm going to hand over to John to take this a little bit further. Okay, um, thanks very much, Keith. So, um, just to uh, say just a couple of words in summary. Um, 
the CPD framework then, there are some assumptions in there that Keith has gone through. The assumption, or the first assumption, it is that there's a correlation between being a good teacher, their qualifications, their language level, and their competence in those areas that Keith has just finished with. There's, a, there's a, a, an assumption there that's part of that framework. The framework then is a description. It describes competence. It describes ability. It describes what we can expect of a, of a good teacher. It doesn't stop there, and this is the, the, the usefulness of the tool, in that it goes on to describe, as Keith said, the kinds of things that teachers can be doing at different stages of their career, different levels of competence. And because the resources that the British Council uses are being mapped against the uh, framework, it also provides the exact kinds of resources, the kinds of things that teachers need to pay attention to, the videos, the texts, the training, the tasks that correspond to where they are, where they themselves have said they are, on that escalator that uh, Keith described. So I'm going to do two things now, and I'm going to do them quite briefly. The first is to talk about, I knew I wouldn't be able to use this, oh, I've got it back here, hang on. Okay, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk about activities and resources, so practical things that teachers can do, and I've got a, a, a booklet here that outlines some of those activities, which I'll hand out in a minute. And the second thing I'm going to do, which really is the focus of this, this second session, is to relate the CPD framework to the quality standards program, to the quality standards framework, to see how those two things overlap and complement each other. So, uh, in terms of activities and resources then, we've looked at, um, we've looked at these in, 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 in relation to three categories, personal, in-school, and external. And for example, personal activities, developing self-awareness, systematic reflection, and target setting. So one, one of the things that I think is um, obvious, but every time I go into a school I'm reminded of it, one of the things that teachers need to do and need to be supported in doing is to reflect on what they are doing and what works well and what doesn't work well. Everybody keeps saying this. The last hundred meetings I've been to um, about teacher development always talk about the ability to reflect. What I've seen in schools, the evidence that teachers are reflecting systematically in a practical, with a practical focus, there isn't much evidence that that is going on. So it's not enough to keep saying, oh, you know, teachers need to reflect more. We need to help them, we need to make resources available so that they can reflect. Um, developing knowledge, private reading and review, that's quite straightforward. Developing skills, systematic practice and review. So probably out of those things there, the other word that I pick up on is review. And that as well as perhaps we're not doing enough to help teachers reflect on what they're doing before they start, we're also not really helping them to think back on what they've done in the classroom. And the, the, the framework provides resources and activities to allow both of those things to happen, the reflection and the review. Um, in terms of in-school activities then, um, again, it's something that, that we're always talking about, um, the, the, the informal opportunities. Staff rooms, they're full of people who are doing very similar work. It's a, uh, an obvious thing that they will talk about, what they're doing, why they're doing, how it's working, all of those things. Okay, but what actually are we doing to encourage that professional interchange in the staff room? Again, it's one of those things we keep talking about it. We need to share experiences amongst colleagues. Of course we do, but what are we doing to actually help them do that? 
Okay, formal workshops. Um, again, we, we, we talk endlessly about formal workshops, about training sessions. Um, the, the advantage of and disadvantages of those are, are, are obvious. But some of the other areas here that we don't really talk much about, things like reading groups, ideas swap shops, lots of things, and there's a list that I'm going to hand out in a second. All of those things are, are easy to think about, but are we actually giving enough time and space for teachers in schools to do them? Okay, Some external activities, it's something that uh, Amor mentioned this morning. Presentations, conferences, and workshops. It's another thing, isn't it? You know, if the next step, you've been a classroom teacher, I've got some experience, I feel like I've got something to share with other practitioners, okay? Well, what's the obvious thing to do? It's going to present at a conference, give a workshop, that kind of thing. To what extent are schools actually, really, in real terms, making it possible for teachers to do these things. We spent a long time talking about teacher associations. So a fantastic way of bringing about professional development. What are schools doing to encourage teachers to become members of teacher associations? We talked long and hard about the importance of self-motivation and clearly that is uh, the, the most fundamental element of developing as a teacher. But what we want to talk about today, and that's one of the things that's very present in the Quality Standards Program, it's about the responsibility of the institution for all the reasons that Keith spoke about this morning. Why do we want good teachers? It's looking at that responsibility and it's measuring that responsibility, and it's laying out steps that schools can take to make sure that they are actually facing up to that responsibility. Okay, so resources, fine, okay. Um, So, before we move on to um, looking at Standard 5, I would like to hand this out. This is a very small booklet that suggests a number of different ways that teachers can go about, if you could help me, that would be great. Thank you very much, Amor. That teachers can go about the business of securing their own professional development. It's for teachers, but what I'm saying, and what we're saying, and what we say through the, uh, the, the Quality Standards Program, it's for teachers, and it's for principals, and it's for schools. It's their responsibility, too. So, the CPD framework then, it's a description of competence. It describes a good teacher. It talks about the kinds of activities that a teacher can be involved in for their professional development. It talks about the resources that are available to help them. And it gives them a scale against which they can assess what level they're at, what stage they're at. And it pinpoints particular areas that they can improve on. Planning lessons. Exploiting resources in the classroom. Using multilingual approaches, a range of different things that they can do. It's for them, but it's also, it's also for schools. And the relationship between the CPD framework 
and the quality standards framework is here. Our standard number five, which says, teachers benefit from appropriate professional development opportunities. So what we say is that at level four, that's the standard that schools have to meet. And like with all the other standards, we're not just saying that that's what you have to do, go away and get on with it. What we're saying is, this is the standard that you need to reach, and this is a way that you can reach that standard. Okay, so agreed, relevant, and coherent. Agreed, relevant, and coherent. The CPD framework provides the opportunity to suggest relevant opportunities because using the framework you can see what level, and teachers can see what level they're at, and you can pinpoint the resources that will be of most benefit to them. Coherent? Yes, it's coherent because, as Keith was saying, it takes teachers through a particular process from awareness to leadership, from being a novice, of being a beginner in a certain area, to somebody who is helping their colleagues and other teachers to develop. So it's coherent in that sense. Agreed? There are some principles here, Keith identified them earlier. In terms, if we asked you the question, do you currently have relevant and coherent and agreed development opportunities for teachers, our experience is, and if we base your answers on what our experience is, principals say, yes, yes, of course we do, yes. We had, we've had, we had 14 workshops last year. So we go along to the, the, the teachers and during the teacher focus group we ask them the same question and they say yes, 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 we had 14 workshops last year. It was great. And we ask the question why did you choose these particular workshops? And if we ask that question to the teachers and the question to the principals, we probably don't get the same answer. So there are many, many things that are going on in terms of professional development opportunities that schools are organizing, but on the whole, our experience is that they could be more relevant, they could be more coherent, and they could probably be more agreed, too. That's what we would say. That's what our experience is. And the CPD framework, as a tool, enables schools and enables teachers to come to that agreed, relevant, coherent framework, program of events. So, the kind of things that we're talking about, so as well as the the standard, as well as the resource, as well as the tool, we'd like to give you an example, the kind of thing that we're talking about. So, this is an example. It's not a standard. It's a way of meeting the standard. It's very straightforward.
Is that relevant? Is it coherent? Is it agreed? No, no it's not. Not at all, not in any way. Is it any of those things? It can only be those things if you have sat down with your teachers and said, okay, so using the CPD framework as a reference, thinking about the needs that you have, the needs of the school, the needs of the teachers, but most importantly, the needs of the students. Our students need this kind of teaching, therefore our teachers need to be able to have these skills or develop these skills or focus on these areas that you've sat down with the teachers and said, okay, so these are the areas, these are the things that we would like to work on. Right? And we're going to do them, all of them, next Saturday between half past, no, and then we're going to do them over a period of time. And we're going to get feedback on how they're working and we're going to measure the impact of them. We're going to ask the children if, as a result of this particular change, let's say, in the way the teacher goes about presenting a particular activity, and we're going to look at that coherently as a whole. What might it include? Well, after you've done that, exercise, it might include those things. It might include a plan for each quarter. It might be something over two weeks. It might make use of people from outside. It might be discussion-based. It might be led by individual teachers. Some of these things that you agree to do together will cost money. If at the beginning of this process, when Keith asked the question, why do we need good teachers? And if we know why we need good teachers, are we therefore prepared to invest in them? Then when it gets to the stage there, when you're sitting down and agreeing what it is that's going to be done over the year or the quarter, then the question about who is going to pay for this, okay? if everybody has agreed that it has to be done and that it should be done and it's part of the process of delivering a quality education to our children that they expect and deserve, then there's obviously going to be some kind of sharing going on there. But if you do it in a coherent and relevant way, it's not going to be the case where you're responding to one-off requests to attend a conference, it's not fair, I didn't go last year, why is he going, th th all of that kind of thing. So what we say in the quality standards framework, standard number five, is that it has to be agreed, coherent, and relevant, for those reasons. <coughs> So, two things to leave you with before we hand over to Chris. These are all suggestions. The quality standards framework, the quality standards program, the consultancy service, all of the things that are in the quality standards program, they are suggestions. They are things that we believe very strongly will contribute to an improvement, to the reflection, to the review of what English medium schools do in English language in India. They are suggestions. The framework, the CPD framework, likewise is a suggestion that we think, we believe very strongly 
that it will have a very beneficial effect. And those two things together, in relation to professional development, the CBD framework and the quality standards framework, we think are two very, very powerful tools that bring together a description of professional development and a system that will help to root that professional development in your school in an agreed, relevant, and coherent way. Okay. Um, I've said all that I'm going to say, I think, today. Um, do any of you have any questions or any comments that you would like to add or put forward before we finish? Hello? I'm working on a CPD program with 12 Delhi schools. Um, uh, thank you for that presentation. I can see the CPD f um, uh, framework will be very, very helpful for teachers to assess the progress of the continuous um, uh, development of their teachers. Um, I think the words systematic and, and relevant are important, but what's even more important is we can find well-qualified parties who can inspire excite and motivate our teachers to want to develop and grow and improve their teaching. And I think those three words were just a little bit missing this afternoon. Um, in my experience, uh, in my very limited experience, as I'm a newcomer to, to India, of working with teachers, I find that the best form of development so far has been teachers talking to each other exciting each other, sharing experiences, and being given the opportunity to go back to the classroom to use the material that they've discussed and shared. Uh, and I would just ask one more thing, um, that possibly you have a quality standards criteria for the providers of CPD, because some of the feedback I've had is that some of the workshops they go to are not particularly helpful and not particularly inspiring and not particularly relevant. So, thank you very much. Working. Why? Oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, there's, n there's nothing to say to that except, you know, w w I agree completely. The, 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 the inspirational side of things, nothing inspires like inspiration. I mean, that's a stupid thing to say. But th all the dry dust in the world is not going to inspire teachers. Uh, a single spark can, can do that. Y in a sense, though, it's very difficult to plan for that and to predict the outcomes. As a, I think as a school principal, you want to have a little bit of sense of direction as to where this is going. And that's what the framework can suggest, can, can provide. But among the resources that John was talking about for moving down that path, I think you can, you, you, a lot of, um, one of them that was mentioned was informal contact between teachers and then workshops. But then a workshop is a very movable feast. A workshop can be the inspirational teacher leading a workshop. A workshop can be a less than inspirational pe person leading it. So um, I, I entirely agree that the most powerful development is sparked somehow in the individual. The trick is to channel that in the right direction for the school and for the individual himself or herself. Just to, to um, in, re in response to the, the second question about the quality, if you like, of the professional de development opportunities that are provided, talked a little bit about this this morning, about teacher educate and teacher educators in that sense. Well, um, in addition to the CPD framework for, for teachers, we're in the process of developing uh, a framework for teacher educators as well. So again, you can't use a framework to make deliverers of training more inspirational, okay? But you can look at what they do in relation to certain criteria and say, well, if you do this, if you've got a competence in this area, then it's more likely that what you talk about 
will be inspirational. Those personality attributes, totally agree with you in the, 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 the story that, that you, I, I, went, I studied French at university for exactly the same reason as you. Yeah. I don't know, Mi Mr. Elliot, his name was not Oh, you go, Grace. Were they French? They were English. Wow, amazing. Um, I just wanted to say um, two things while I'm feeling inspired. One thing that Liz triggered for me because it, it reminded me of something that you'd said about one of the ways to develop professionally is actually maybe to do a bit of action research or something in the classroom and then dare to present that in a workshop. And I remember when I was a teacher, um, something that really developed me as a teacher was to dare to actually run some workshops, even when I thought I didn't know what I was talking about. But from my little, you know, beginning steps of actually sharing that with others, I grew in confidence a great deal. So uh, that's, that's the point about quality of CPD, because I think sometimes it's between ourselves. We might be running the CPD session, and maybe we're rubbish because it's the first time we've done it but at least we're out there doing it. So I think the quality element is not just about sitting there and being the recipient of quality, but actually daring to break outside your comfort zone and stand up and really attempt to, to you know, share something. And yeah, it might be rubbish, but maybe the next time you do it, if you get some honest feedback, it could be a little bit better. As it's just from my own experience. And, and that also reminded me, unfortunately, the person concerned, I think she's now left, but you mentioned um, IELTS as, a, as an example of if you wanted to test how you were with your language skills. Well, there's two things I wanted to say. One, that there's, um, in, in your pack set, talks about another um, uh, test that you, know, you could, could do, or your organization could sign up for, which is Aptus for Teachers. Um, and, and that one, it, it doesn't get you a visa to go to the UK, but it does give you a little bit of a comparison of your level against the um, Common European Framework. But secondly, um, on the IELTS bit, um, the woman I was talking to, um, she sounded very, very good in English. Um, she, like you, was, was at this conference. And I, uh, she was asking me about IELTS, and I said, well, are you interested in being an IELTS examiner? Because we need lots of IELTS examiners. And she said, oh, no, 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 I looked at the website, and I saw that you have to be 99999, which is the top level of IELTS, to be an examiner. And she said, I looked at it and I got frightened and I never wrote to you. And I said, well, how do you know you're not 99999? Because she sounded pretty good to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm just a director of exams. I don't actually do the examining. I used to be an examiner, so I kind of have an idea. And she said, oh, I don't know how I know. I just thought that. And I thought, said, well, well, why don't you go ahead and test yourself? And you might get a pleasant surprise. You might actually be 99999. Or you might be 97.586. You might have what we call a jagged profile. But hey, it, it gives you an, some feedback about your level. And let's imagine that you are 9999. How are you going to feel? And she actually grew taller in front of me. And so all I was going to say is that tests sometimes are really, really useful because they, they let us know where we stand. And don't be afraid of them because either you are 99999 or you're not. And if you're not and you want to be, what can you do? You can maybe sort of work to, to try and get better. And if you think you're going to give a rubbish CPD workshop, we'll do it anyway because the feedback will help you to improve. So that's my little inspirational piece at the end of this because it's certainly how I helped um, my own development by sometimes testing myself. And testing isn't just formal testing, it's actually daring to run a workshop, which is pretty scary. How many of you have run a workshop, by the way? Hands up. Hands up. Liz, I'm sure you have. Yeah. Okay, so most of us have done. Some people didn't put their hands up. It means you haven't dared to do it. So I dare you to do it. That's it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions that you have relating to the, the last session? Yeah, come on. Uh, this CPD framework has a very interesting circular design, which uh, helps an individual teacher to map his or her own present location and where could be uh, the way forward. All these uh, developmental areas are marked there in terms of arrows converging into a center. 
and uh, you can look at each separate arrow and locate your position where you are now. And you also look, the, look at the possibilities in, uh, in progressing along those arrows. And it's a very interesting tool which helps us to realize where we are in different developmental areas and where we might go. And I believe that that framework too, that uh, map is also under revision and hopefully in another couple of months time we will have even better version. So if someone wants to do it on his or her own, irrespective of school or institutional support, even then that framework is a very useful tool. Great. Okay, thank you very much. And, and it's the, the new one is gonna be out in In April, okay. In April. Uh, 11th to 14th of April in Manchester. Right, okay, thank you very much.